Well, we're picking up a little bit where we left off. We're in a sermon series this week on the afterlife. And we started with the afterlife in the Old Testament. From there, we moved on to the idea of the resurrection that comes in in the book of Daniel. Then we talked about the resurrection of Jesus. And today we're going to talk about heaven itself, the heavenly kingdom, the place where we will spend eternity. But there's a lot of weird thinking out there about heaven. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but when I think about the books I've read or the movies I've watched, even some of the cartoons I've seen that depict heaven, that, sh- that attempt to describe or imagine what heaven is like, I've got to say, I've never seen an image or an idea of heaven that's a place I'd want to spend eternity. It, it leaves a little bit to be desired, doesn't it? The popular depictions of heaven. And we're not the first to notice that. Mark Twain noticed that. And I want to go over something that he wrote. This is a book that Twain wrote called Letters from the Earth. It was never published during his lifetime because it was seen as too controversial. But it's typical Mark Twain. It's funny. It's satire. It's parody. But what makes it a little bit edgy is that he writes from the point of view of Lucifer, Lucifer sees that God has created the world and has created a new species, human beings. And Lucifer, like all the angels in heaven, is curious. So Lucifer goes on an anthropological expedition down to earth to explore, and he writes letters from the earth back to his angel buddies in heaven describing this strange creature named man. And here he writes about human beings and their idea of heaven. He writes to the angels and he says, first, you need to know a few things about human beings. He says, humans consider sex their greatest pleasure. He says, most men do not sing and don't care to learn. Most men do not pray, and when they do, they like it brief. More men go to church than want to. Of all the men in a church on Sunday, two-thirds are tired when it is half over, the rest before it is finished. The gladdest moment of all is the benediction. Lastly, all nations of men hate all other nations. Every race and ethnicity does not get along with the others. Then he writes, note all that, and when you hear what man thinks of heaven, now you know what the human race enjoys and what it doesn't enjoy. It has invented a heaven out of its own head all by itself. Guess what it's like. In 1,500 eternities, you couldn't do it. Very well, I will tell you about it. First, they have left sex out of heaven, their greatest pleasure. Two, in man's heaven, everybody sings. The singing is not casual, not relieved by intervals of quiet. It goes on all day long and every day, and everybody stays. Whereas in the earth, the place would be empty in two hours. Three, every person is playing a harp, while not more than 20 in a thousand could play on earth or ever wanted to. They conceive of heaven as a never-ending church service. And five, in heaven, they imagine that, an, that all nations of the earth live in one common jumble. All are on an equality absolute, no one of them ranking another. They have to be brothers. They have to mix together, pray together, harp together, hosanna together. Here on earth, all nations hate each other, and every one of them hates the Jew. Yet every pious person adores that heaven and wants to get into it. By this time, I hope you'll notice that what human beings imagine as heaven leaves quite a bit to be desired. Now, if you think heaven is floating around on clouds, playing harps with angels, the Bible has a different story. Now, you, you, could, you could read books about near-death experiences, and you're welcome to do that. I think they're fascinating, but I won't talk about that this morning what people experience after they die and sometimes are revived. And it's not because I have anything negative to say. It's just that you don't know for sure what that's about. 
people that write books about their near-death experiences in the afterlife, you don't know if that's just their brain doing something strange. You don't know for sure, unfortunately, if they've just made it up because they want to write a book and make money. So I want to stick this morning with what the Bible says about heaven. This is what scripture says heaven will be like. And we're going to read two texts. First is from Romans. Chapter 8, verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time, and we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Then Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. The sea is an image of chaos in ancient thought. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God and they will be my children. This is the word of the Lord. First, these scriptures tell us that heaven is not somewhere else. Heaven is not up in the clouds. Heaven is not in space. Heaven is not in another dimension. Heaven is here. Heaven is this earth transformed, renewed, cleansed of all sin, cleansed of death, cleansed of suffering, but this world. We do not die and go to heaven. Heaven comes to us. Now, doesn't Jesus talk about going to heaven? Well, if you read closely, no. Jesus talks about entering the kingdom of heaven. About coming into it, about receiving it. Heaven comes here. That's the image, the direction of movement in the passage in Revelation is the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city coming down. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven comes to earth. In the end, our eternal destiny is to live here in a new, a renewed earth in a perfect city without death, without sadness, without decay. Children often ask the question, especially when they lose a pet, do dogs go to heaven? Do animals go to heaven? What's included in heaven? Is it just souls? Well, you know from a few weeks ago that it's not just souls, that we have bodies. And Paul in the Romans passage talks about these bodies. But is it only human beings that are included in heaven? And everything else that God has made 
is wiped away? Absolutely not. Paul says all creation groans for the restoration that will come. I'm going to read a, a short passage from an article about heaven. A scholar writes this, Salvation is cosmic in scope and includes all creation. That the promised kingdom of God will be nothing but this world restored and transfigured by the glory of God in its every dimension, vegetal, animal, rational, and social. That a deified humanity will serve therein as a cosmic priesthood, receiving that glory from Christ and mediating it to the natural world. Someone who studied the ancient text would have encountered the now standard motif of the redeemed cosmos as the burning bush pervaded by the divine glory, but unconsumed and infinitely realized theophany. That's some fancy language. But notice the image there. First point is that heaven is here. The new Jerusalem descends, creation is restored and redeemed. The second image is the burning bush, and you know the story. Moses walks along, he hears a voice, he turns and he sees a bush engulfed in flames, but unconsumed. The bush is burning, but it's not burning away or burning up. The bush is there, perfect, whole, unconsumed, but covered in fire. And that fire is God's presence. Well, heaven is this earth in the place of that bush. Heaven is this world fully consumed, fully burned, fully on fire, surrounded with the presence of God, but unconsumed, not burned up. Heaven is the presence of God, and it's here. You know, some of you know, if you were here last week, that I was not here. I was conducting a wedding for a couple. Their names are James and Presley. Here's a picture of them. We had a beautiful wedding but it made me think about heaven because the, the two images I've given you so far, the new city descending to earth, the bush on fire with the presence of God but unconsumed, those are two dominant images in the New Testament for what heaven is like. But the third, the third is a wedding. Heaven is like a wedding. I'm going to give you three scriptures the first, Revelation chapter eleven fifteen. the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his, of his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. The wedding is of this world and of heaven. The afterlife is not an escape from this world to another place. The afterlife is a marriage, a coming together of the heavenly and the earthly. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world joined together as one. That's heaven. Next scripture, Revelation chapter 19. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. The lamb is Jesus, of course. And his bride who is the church, is us. His bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Heaven is a marriage feast, not just a wedding, but a wedding reception, a proper party. The last scripture from the one we read earlier. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Again, heaven is not an escape. It's a wedding. Heaven is not a place you go to. It's a union of the heavenly and the earthly so that everything you know and love about this life is included and it makes sense because Genesis chapter 1 tells us God made this world and everything in it and he called it good. And does God throw away anything he's made? Does God abandon his creation? 
Does God let, let, let be destroyed anything he called good? No. Everything God has created and called good will be redeemed, will be saved. Yes, it will be cleansed. It will be restored. It will be renewed. It will have to be, just as we have to be cleansed and renewed. Nothing sinful can enter the kingdom of heaven. But everything God has made is good and will be conserved and preserved in heaven. Last slide. That's a picture of the ceremony in black and white. This is the image of, of heaven. And I think every, every one of you has been to a wedding. So you know the joy. You know the excitement. You know the beauty of husband and wife coming together as one. And then you know what a good reception is like. A party where everyone's coming together to celebrate this union, this wedding, where two become one. And heaven is the same. Eternity is that joyful celebration of the bliss of wedding. Not the wedding of a man and a woman, but the wedding of human and divine the wedding of earth and heaven. That's our hope. That's how our eternity will be spent. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you've given us a hope that does not disappoint. Lord, we do not look for an escape into a fantasy world of harps and singing. But we wait and we hope for what Scripture promises us will be the restoration of every good thing that we know and love. We thank you that heaven promises us freedom from sin, the absence of pain, the absence of suffering. There will be no evil. But we will be there and all that you have made will be there transformed, redeemed, cleansed at the wedding feast of the Lamb, the wedding of heaven and earth, the wedding of Christ and his church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.